Welcome to Amplify Your Mindset with Ricky Kelman. Motivational speaker, mindset expert, and celebrity hypnotist Ricky Kelman has amazed audiences around the world. Kalman empowers his audience with simple but powerful techniques to boost confidence and belief toward their goals and to exceed their own personal and professional expectations. Each episode features business leaders, motivators, and incredible individuals who share how mindset has contributed to their success. Put awareness and action into your life with the confidence that you'll succeed at the things you want to make happen. Here is Ricky Kalman. Hi, this is Ricky Kalman, and welcome to another episode of Amplify Your Mindset. My special guest is Emmy Award-winning television journalist Mark Steinis. Mark, along with Lisa Gibbons, are the annual hosts of the KTLA's Rose Parade broadcast. He helped set the gold standard in entertainment news while working at Entertainment Tonight for more than 17 years. He began his tenure as the show's leading entertainment reporter and weekend anchor. He then was elevated to co-host alongside Mary Hart from 2005 to 2012. Following Entertainment Tonight, for six years, Mark co-hosted Hallmark Channel's Home and Family, helping the show earn three Emmy nominations. He received an Emmy Award for the KCAL TV special Beyond Endurance Madagascar, an Emmy and Golden Mike Award Beyond Endurance Borneo, an Emmy as host for the 2005 Hollywood Christmas Parade, a National Iris Award for the special The Big Business of Sports Endorsements and nationally recognized by the Women's Sports Foundation for his impartial reporting on the Women's National Football League. He has a best-selling inspiration picture book featuring his family three-pound therapy dog, Norbert. The book, Norbert's Little Lessons for a Big Life, photographed by Mark Steinis, features lessons on friendship, individuality, family, and love. A born fitness enthusiast, Mark was featured in People Magazine's coveted Sexiest Man Alive issue and Men's Fitness Magazine's 25 Fittest Men in America. Mark Steinis, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, It's good to hear you again. Last time we sat in my trailer uh, on the set of my show and, and just had such a wonderful conversation. So congratulations on the podcast, all the success that you've had and I'm such a fan. Oh, well, and, and I am of yours as well. And it's funny because that's exactly why I wanted to have you on as a guest. Um, I'm always looking for somebody that has a unique twist or a, a story to share that can be inspiring to other people. And millions of people know you as this incredible journalist and host. But and they also see this personal side of you because you're very charismatic. You, you, you welcome people in um, immediately when people see you on whether you're 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 hosting or doing a story about something, and I'm I'm just I'm being very truthful here. You welcome people as though everybody's your friend, and we had this very unique conversation because we started talking about mindset before we started taping that day, mm-hmm. and I remember that conversation. I'm like, okay, Mark gets this. I, I, I know we're going to connect at some point, whether I did a show with you or or something else. And I knew something was going to come up in the future, and here we are today. Yeah, and and I hope this is is just the beginning of um, several conversations or interactions that we have. I really think, Ricky, it's so important that the, the you know we had we just for people listening. The backstory was as you came onto the show, you were doing, um, and with all due respect, sort of the dog and pony show, the hypnotist stuff, the people that what things are entertained by and all that. But then when we sat and talked uh, before the show in my trailer, and and not that there's there, I'm not discrediting hypnotism because I believe in everything by that. But we had such a deeper conversation of what everybody can apply to, and 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 I had. It's nice to find people out there that that understand mindset, understand perspective, understand balance, understand that we're all human beings. I look at you know. Um, I try to look at this is something that I learned from John Travolta actually when I spend so many times with this man and movie sets and interviewing through the years. One thing that I felt from him is this tremendous amount of presence in anytime he has a conversation with you, you feel like he woke up that day, got dressed and came into your world so he could meet you. And then he was going to, in some way or another, find something that made you unique that in my mind, I was like, he's going to use that in his craft. Like 
the way he, the way Mark talks about this or whatever. But it was, it was amazing. It's an amazing experience to see someone like him who, who's an amazing actor work his craft, but not when the cameras were, weren't around, but, uh, or when they weren't around, when he was willing to sit with you and just have a conversation and be so present. There was a point I'll share with you real quick. We were flying back. I was coming back. He was doing some toy fair or something for one of his movies in New York. And he said, are you going back tonight? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you want to fly with us on the jet? And I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> sure, why really not? Quickly. But when he goes, okay, so where's your hotel? They got all the arrangements. He goes, we'll pull up. And it was like right on schedule. They were like 715, be out front, have your bags, leave your bags there. I'll be in the first car. I'll have somebody retrieve, put the bags in the back second car and just hop in with me and we'll talk. So it was just like one of these things that, you know, you feel like you're on a schedule, but it was great. Pulled in, got out at the Waldorf and, you know, was waiting there. Boom, jumped in the back of the car. Now, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know, know John, but I haven't, usually it's been in circles, but now all of a sudden I'm sitting in the back of a, you know, a town car with him and he immediately goes in so like just deep. He goes, okay, so tell me about your family. And I'm like, well, I got a mom, dad, brother. And he goes, okay, so what's your relationship like with your dad? How would you characterize your relationship with your father? And he began to really want to know more about who I was. And I'm thinking, this is John Travolta. Welcome back, Kater. You know, like, <laughs> and he was so interested in me as a person. Yeah. And that's that was one of the days I went, mm -hmm. this is how you, this is this is how we all should relate. If we we care more about the people around us and be curious and feel of wonderment, um, you know, we're going to get to know people and you're going to be warm. You're going to be insightful. You're going to have that right mindset. That's what we're talking about today. Yeah. You know, what you just said is, is so true. I think that all too often we don't sit in the audience and listen to other people. We run through feeling as though we have to, you know, focus on sometimes ourself. And it, mm -hmm. I think in communication that Wow, what a powerful thing uh, that he shared that with you in, 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 a, in a very unique way to it, – it's it, it, and I'm actually kind of tongue-tied on it because, you know, mm. here he, he was – he really taught you something that, and that it comes off in what you do every day I, well, as you talk to people. I, I think that's what I'm, what I'm coming to is that it was a lesson that you picked up very quickly. Yeah, I mean he was – Usually it was the other way around. I'm usually the ones asking the question. Right, right. And to see somebody kind of put you in that position and, and truly care. He wasn't just trying to have small talk. It wasn't like, hey, you've been to New York often. What do you think of the city? Oh, this traffic is bad. He was he immediately wanted to know about me as a person. Interesting. And that was a huge, a, a huge compliment. And I don't think not just because it was John Travolta. Anytime you are engaged with somebody, you know, if you can make them feel like the reason you woke up that day was to run into them for that five and a half minutes, like, you know, who else does that is my co-host for the Rose Parade, Lisa Gibbons. Mm -hmm. She is an amazingly present individual. She is, you don't see her like on her phone texting and then talking to you at the same time. <laughs> She's not multitasking. She is just present. And that is, that is something I think in a world we live in right now, we have our mind going in so many different directions. It's, and, I, and I'm guilty of this. You know, I try to be more present. I have a little baby daughter now. She's 18 months old. And I'm trying to just watch every little thing that she does because she changes every day. Right. Um, you know, I was, I was just reading something recently. Um, and um, we were, there were, we were, it was talking about the difference between are you looking or are you seeing? Because there's two different things. That's involved. Yeah, I can look at my daughter and be like, okay, she's doing this, but what am I really seeing? Is she really, you know, what am I seeing her and how is she handling this particular scenario? And I see her running around the couch, but I also, uh, I, I can look and see her. She likes to run around the couch, but I see a young child that's very comfortable on a soft surface. She's got tremendous balance at this young age and um, confidence. And you begin to really search. And the more you see, I think the more the world opens up to you. Um, and, and there lies some of the answers, you know, that, that we all look for. It's like, you know, what's next? And we go through transitions and I'm, you know, grateful to have that. I'm, you know, I'm a father again at 55 when I have a 16 and a, almost seven, a 15 and a, almost 17 year old getting a awesome. driver. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and 
it's it is both um, like I know people who are my age that I went to school with who are grandparents and I'm just a young dad again or a dad of a young one. And it does make me feel young. And it is it is a wonderful perspective to have. Um, some people look at that, Ricky, and they go like, oh, God, you're going through all that again. And I'm like, hmm. That's interesting you say that. I, I, <laughs> like, I get to do this again. Yeah, that, I was just about to say that you get to do this, and that's that's a yeah. powerful thing. And some of the things that you were just saying about being so um, aware and conscious of walking and a smile and the things that you celebrate every day, I think that that probably comes from your training as as a journalist, as a host, talking to people, interviewing people. Let's go back a little bit. How, how did this all start for you? How did you get in the business? That's a great question. You know, I'm looking right now at my children, my, my two boys, and I'm I'm trying to. It's so hard because they're both. You, you can't raise your children identically, even though they come from the same you know source. They're two different people, so they think differently and act differently. But I'm trying to watch what they do naturally, and I try to encourage them to follow that path, because that that is what's going to be the organic self. And then they get to go to work and do this every day. It's never a job. So. My one son right now, I'll get to your, I'll get an answer here in a second, but my one son's very much into sound design. They're, they they play music, they're, they'll sit in the room all day long and not even change their pajamas on the weekends <laughs> and they're tech, doing mixing stuff or whatever. So he wants to get into sound design and sound design is different than doing soundtracks. It's a, the sound effects in video games and he's like, dad, do you know a broken bone is really when somebody breaks a stick of celery? And then they slow that down and they make it sound like, I'm like, that's really cool. So he wants to go to school for that. For me, I go back and trace my roots back to when I was young. I, for whatever reason, I had a close in play. And which is for those who are old enough to know, it's a record player. And it really helped you put the needle on the record because kids couldn't have a you know good time doing it with a steady hand. But I loved playing DJ. And I somewhere I know they're probably thrown away now, but in my parents' house on old cassette tapes, I would record myself as the morning DJ. You know, hey, get your back out of there, get your day underway. I got a good song for you. And and it started off as that. And then I realized, hmm, I don't have the confidence to be on camera. Because I'm not a good public speaker. That's not what I wanted to do. But I thought, what if I get behind the camera? I'm right there. And I started um, shooting a lot, photography. We went into in college. I wanted to get into film class. There was a, I had a scholarship to play football in Northern Iowa. And just as I made the the leap to do taking eight millimeter film, they they took that they got rid of that from the program because it just wasn't going anywhere. anywhere. But they brought in a thing called videotape. It's really <laughs> prehistoric, but they brought in this whole new department and they re, rebuilt everything and new edit base and all that. And that was so interesting to me. As soon as I hit that program, my grades, my GPA went through the roof. I ended up getting not only a full ride athletic scholarship, but I had two academic scholarships, uh, paid pro, um, programs at the local TV station where I was a photographer. I ran studio cameras and I was behind the scenes and that when I met two people who today I still respect and admire. One's a, one's a senator now, um, Liz Mathis. The other, uh, she was an anchor at the time. The other's Ron Steele, mm -hmm. who is still an anchor back in Waterloo, Iowa. And they saw in me what I did not see in myself. And they kept after me saying, get in front of the camera. I would go do shoots. They'd be like, here, now you take it. I'm like, no, I'm not going to, I don't want to do that. And they would, they would force me into a position. And I worked at it and worked at it and worked at it and um, eventually felt comfortable enough with what I had to put it out for the world to see. But it still was intimidating and I was still very fearful of that opportunity. And then, in a, which the story is out there and people can find it probably, but in 1988, the Republican National Convention in New Orleans, I, ever since high school and the outsiders came out, people always came to me like, you look like Tom Cruise. You look like Tom. Oh my God, you look like Tom Cruise. Did you see the movie, the outsiders? And I'm like, no, I have to look at it. So in 88 at the convention in new Orleans, I was mistaken as Tom Cruise and it made news entertainment. And I did a story on it. And after it aired, I had three job offers, one in um, South Carolina, one in Bakersfield, California, and then one in Springfield, Missouri, which is where I went and had my first ever on-camera experience, which I still, to this day, 
have on tape and I look at it and it keeps me humble. Um, but that's, I know that's a long sort of an answer to your. No, that's awesome. Question, but it's, I it's didn't know path. this. Yeah. Because it's a path that, you know, many times it's hard to get into this line of work. And when the, when the door opens an opportunity is on the other side of that, you got to be able to jump and take it ready or not. And then, um, the, just to expand on that ready or not moment is when I was in Springfield for a two of my three year contract. And one day, I don't know what happened. Two agents called me and I had job offer or job, you know, interviews in San Diego and one in Cleveland. I never made it to the one in Cleveland. I went to the one in San Diego, bombed terribly, just got dry mouth, was nervous. And my agent, um, Peter Goldberg said, Hey, grab a flight, go up and see this woman, Beth Meharry at KKL channel nine in Los Angeles. And I went into that meeting with her and I was so mad at myself for bombing. I was like, this is San Diego. I could be, this would be an amazing opportunity. I was a sportscaster. So I went in to see Beth and Beth was offering a position, but there was no, there was no hosting. There was no anchoring. It was just all field reporting. And I, I don't know where I got it. If it was just angry at myself, I said, thank you, but no. I said, I'll end up in this market one day as a sports director, perhaps. If I have to go through Colorado and Denver and Dallas or Chicago, whatever it is, I will be back here. And I went home to Springfield, back to my job and my humble beginnings. And about a week or 10 days later, they called and said, we'll give you one day a week, Saturday nights. So I took it. I came to L.A. and I was here for a short period of time and I was driving home on the 10 freeway. And our, our KCAL Channel 9 here in Los Angeles carried the Lakers. And when... I was driving and the Lakers had been on and they won and they were doing really well at that time. And I thought, wow, you know, a lot of bars in town probably had the game on and then just didn't change it. And there's a great chance people probably saw me. And then I went, <laughs> well, if the bars in town have that on because you, know, you go out and you know, sports bars would have it. I wonder if Johnny Carson is a Laker fan. Oh, and so then horrible. it hit me. I was like, Johnny Carson could have seen me on TV. I grew up watching him every night, eating a bologna sandwich with Doritos at 10 o'clock at night when he would come on and here's Johnny. I'm like, oh my God, it was such a far stretch. And now I was working in the market that he could have accidentally watched me or had his TV you know, on and just didn't change the channel. And when that reality hit me, I went, wow, there's so much potential here for exposure, for growth. I need to up my game. And that's when I really began taking not I didn't I took myself seriously but I was like every opportunity every moment I cannot back off everything has to be specific I have to be a great storyteller um, and my career just began to grow and I was there for about three years when Entertainment Tonight called and said hey I see what you're doing and the rest is history it was 17 wow. years of Entertainment Tonight and then on to Home and Family for six that's it, it, I did not know that earlier story. That's very cool. And yeah. what's even more amazing is that you actually told yourself, I could never go in front of the camera. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, you, you, that's that's the amazing part of it. And that goes to – now I'm going to hit to the listeners here because the people that listen to this are going to be the – you know, the sales individual, the entrepreneur, the CEFO, the CEO, anybody that speaks mm -hmm. in public, when you say something like that, I cannot do it. Your brain works really hard to to really fulfill that thought process. You win to fail based on that belief. And mm -hmm. it took, you know, it took a while. It took other people to inspire you. And then you got it. You understood that fuel and yeah. that propelled you who you are today and, 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 it looks so natural. Again, I'll go back to the, we first started talking at the beginning of this program is that when you're talking, your audience feels as though that, that you are talking directly. This is my personal opinion and I, I'm sure I'm not alone. You are talking directly to them. You become friends with that audience so quickly. And I've seen you do interviews with a lot of other celebrities and boy, very quickly, they see that connection too. And I think that's what you, why you, you've done such an amazing job in interviews. Thank you. I, I want to add something else, Ricky, because I, I don't want to leave this out. I'm, and this isn't about anything overly religious, but it's more of a spiritual thing. And, a, and a, I, don't, I don't think things in our world happen by chance. I, I, you know, I always subscribe to the theory when things get really tough, you know, we always like, oh, I better go to church and pray or do whatever. Um, you know, when, when, when things get tough and they have been in my life and, and um, you know, there's that saying, let go and let God. So that takes a lot of the pressure off yourself. However, there was a moment in my career where 
I just had to say there was something that it just was it was it meant it was meant to be. Mm-hmm. When I was at KCAL, we would do a series that was called California Adventure. And it was because we wanted to celebrate the lifestyle in Southern California. You could go surfing. You could go skiing in the morning and come down and surf at night, you know, out of the mountains. You could go rock climbing, mountain biking. You there's so much you could do here. So I would go out and do these things. And the one particular story aired where I was doing indoor rock climbing, um, which I was not very good at. And when I answered the phone in the sports department, this guy, um, John Craig, says, hey, just saw your story. That was really good. I see what you're doing. I got a California adventure for you. And I was like, what do you got? And he goes, ah, you probably wouldn't do it. And I go, lay it on me. I'll do it. And he said, and this time I was, you know, young and full of, you know, look at me. I'm in L.A. And he goes, why don't you come? We, we, we walk on fire. And I went, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, we, we, we walk on fire. Come on down. And I, and in my mind, I'm going, oh, this is like one of those circus acts where you lie down on a bed of nails or you chew glass or something. So I end up completely unaware of what I was getting into. But um, the Lighthouse, Lighthouse Institute, so there were two guys, John Labriol and John, and John Craig, um, or Tom Craig, um, put on this evening of really learning about what they referred to as their lieutenant. In your brain you know, that person that talks to you, that, mm-hmm. that tells you you're not good enough and you don't, you have no business being here. And it all comes back to the fire walk, which led me down the path. I did Tony Robbins stuff and all that and really worked on myself. But what it did was it helped restore that confidence that I didn't have back in Waterloo, Iowa. It helped me find those insecurities that I have and understand that we all have them. We're just hiding them from people. Absolutely. And it's okay. It's okay but it's also us in the way of ourselves. Like we're, if we just get, uh, if we get out of our path, we'll be able to reach success. We'll be able to stay in there up on that stage and know that it's okay to be you and be present. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. In, in my corporate training programs, um, one of the examples that I'll lead people into is very similar. The most powerful hypnotist in the world is ourselves. So that lieutenant that was talking to you, that voice, is mm-hmm. that inner hypnotist, either guiding you to the path of negativity, doubt, disbelief, frustration, anger, mis- misdirection, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Or it could be the voice that guides you and says, hey, it could have been worse. I'm going to do better today. I can celebrate those magical moments that make me feel good. Um, I can be as good as the guy next door and even better. And that voice yeah. that literally guides you because – I really think a lot of people dismiss the power that it has. And, and you know, it, it's a much longer conversation, but that simple little example. And again, I tell people all the time, listen, I'm not, I'm not inventing the wheel again here. I'm just yeah. showing you something to look at in a different point of view. And if you understand what your example and my example now, well, it, that's everything. We just want to, we want to be able to get this information out to you. And if one thing resonated with you today in this podcast, this conversation, the story, the example that you're sharing, then you understand that inner voice even more today. Mm-hmm. It's a very powerful thing. How do we, how would you suggest, you know, I, I the reason I brought up the fire walk is if somebody had told me to go to that, that, oh, <laughs> exactly. whatever, I wouldn't have gone. I had to kind of be, this is why I think it was sort of divine intervention. It's that I was sort of like led into it in the only way. I probably would have. But once I was there and the discovery happened, I was like, oh, now I'm really interested in this. But what about what do you say to people who don't know how to listen to that inner thought or that inner voice of theirs? How do they find it? How do they go after it and search for it? And because a lot of times it it's scary, you know, to, sure. to sit back and go, these are my fears or my weaknesses or my demons or whatever that well, are really guiding me. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go farther, deeper into that question. And it's a much larger you know, answer, but we're afraid mm-hmm. of change. We like comfort. People like that warm, fuzzy blanket. They, they don't want to take it off and get cold. Uh, change is scary. Uh, and, and the unknown is scary. And sometimes when the unknown, if, you, if we don't know enough about it, we dismiss it and go, it's just not possible. It's, I'm not interested. Because sometimes, again, we, we don't have enough awareness towards growth and mm-hmm. our own abilities. And I think that it starts slow. Uh, nothing happens overnight. Look at the, look what you've done in your career. And if you look back at all my other guests in the past, nothing happened over, there's no overnight success. The way I would say it, overnight yeah, success right. took yeah. 30 years. Yeah. You know, um, 
I, I think you start slow by creating more examples. That's what this podcast is about. This is what these interviews are about and these conversations about giving people different ways to become more emotionally aware of their thoughts. And I'm not saying we got to get really emotional. We got to cry and we got to really deep down. We got to get that. We got to go to the very bottom. No, I, I, what I'm saying is slow down. Become mm-hmm. more aware. Take a few moments. We live now, and again, a society of we expect everything so fast. We can answer five emails, one conversation, Snapchat, face, face, yeah. Facebook. We, we try to do so much at one time, and I'm just yeah. as guilty of doing all those things, and I have to put myself in check every single day. So to the person that says it's not possible, I'm not interested, I don't believe it, I would just start by saying, hey, what, can we just slow down a minute? Let's just take a deep breath. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that sounds very simple, but I, I am sure before you go on air, before you record anything, before you do an interview, before you meet a, a, a rock star, movie star, a politician, I'm sure that even you take a step back and put yourself in a check. Here I am. Look at this opportunity. Look what I'm yeah. about to do. They're a human being, and I've been given an opportunity to speak to them, and I'm going to be in tune, and I'm going to be in the now. Mm-hmm. And that took time to get to that 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 whole mental attitude that you have now, but I believe anybody listening could do that. I think anybody, if they put their mind to it, they continually repeat that process. If you put your mind to it, I know that seems so simple. The possibilities are unlimited. There's a, a moment that happened in my life too that was very important i was in madagascar no i was in borneo shooting a documentary um one of them that i received and fortunate blessed to have an emmy from and a good friend of mine who is now extremely successful um as he his name is trent cameraman and he owns his own company and he i don't know now what he has his own studio warehouse everything and it all started with his camera gear as a freelance cameraman uh, was stolen out of the back of his van while he was getting some fast food. And we, we were having this conversation. We were in a tent and we were shooting um, this race called the Ray Galois, which is a French race. And we were discussing that. And he was still in the process of rebuilding his whole life. And the, and the, the conversation about failure came up because we're so afraid to fail. And he looked at me and he goes, he said something that just completely was, I'm like, dude, what? He goes, I love failure. And he just said it as a, matter of fact. And I go, go, wait, what? And he goes, no, I really do. I love failing. And I go, what, what, what do you, why? Like, that's what most people try not to do. And he goes, no, because if I set out to do something, I have an expectation of what the outcome is going to be. And if that expectation doesn't happen, it's now considered, you know, a a failure. Like it wasn't what I expected it to be, but within that gap is what's called learning. And that means I have an opportunity to grow. Right. So therefore, I don't fail. I, I look forward to, quote, I'm using the word fail as if you don't learn something from it. Then it's probably a failure uh, by many um, would consider. But he looked at it from that perspective, that mindset, if you will. It's like just because things didn't turn out the way they did, it means I need to ask better questions or I didn't, it, it, didn't, I didn't, it didn't occur to me. But now it does. And that's why the, there's wise old men and women in this world, because they've been through those experiences and they know what to expect and what not to expect. Um, you know, setting those smart goals, as my kids have learned in school, you know, um, it's so important. So Very unique um, thought process. Failure is fuel. Mm. My grandfather yeah. used to say this all the time, uh, and, and it's it still sticks with me. You know, uh, I'm sure you've heard the the story uh, or the or the saying: "In the dog bites you once, shame on the dog. Yeah. Dog bites you twice, shame on you." And yeah. I, I look at it that like what you just said. It's like you know, okay, all right, the dog bit me. Now I got to fix it. You know, I'm not going to let it happen again. But I'm going to use my experience to get me to a better place. And it's funny because yeah. I say this so often and I, and I didn't realize it until you just said that. And we talked about the failure uh, of, of excitement, you know, to, to use that as, as a, as a fuel. Yeah. It's important, you know, cause everybody has setback backs and, you know, you look at it and you kind of go, God, I just am a failure. And sometimes your confidence gets in the 
in the crapper and you just, but you have to remember that there's, there's ups and downs in life. So there's journey. It's a journey. It's a process. And every day you get a second chance, you know, that's, well, what's wonderful about life. Yeah. Before, we're running out of time, but I, I wanted—I do want to ask you a question because this is something mm-hmm. I was thinking about uh, a, a lot. Like, well, if I could ask you one question, this is the one question. Uh, many times you have to interview, I shouldn't say have to, many times you interview somebody that is going to share a story that is going to be so emotionally effective, affecting you because you're right there hearing it. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're reading a story from a teleprompter that, is so compelling to the, the viewer. How do you keep your composure? How do you, if you don't mind sharing, what mm-hmm. what do you do to help keep you on track? Because I, I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm sure there are situations that that you go, this is going to be difficult, or this is going to be very heartfelt, emotional. I got to keep it together. It's a great question. Um, First of all, I, if if I'm doing if I'm reading something that is uh, newsworthy and the information is important to get across, let's say it was, and I'm going to speak of some very emotional times for even Americans, um, 9/11, and some of the stories that we did at Entertainment Tonight were very news-driven stories, and they never aired because we were preempted, but they were some of the best shows we've ever done we ever did there. What I try to tell myself in that point as a journalist is. My job is to communicate in a clear manner as not to overhype or extend um, further fear amongst the viewers. Let me be clear with this information with you. Let me be concise and let me put it in a form where you can understand it and not let my emotions confuse you or not get in the way of the message. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, from that perspective. However, if I'm sitting down with somebody who is sharing an emotional journey with me, whether that they have bounced back and are, you know, have faced their demons, whether it's in recovery, whether it's in whatever it is that they've had to, to go through, I go with them on that trip. I do my best to, to stay with them on, on that journey. And if I'm impacted by it, I allow those feelings to surface. Okay. Um, it's not, it's not something that, you know, otherwise I'm not human. And, um, again, it goes back to, uh, this, this is an experience that, um, I'll leave with you is, so when I got, I, I'd gone through five years of acting training, Stanislavski method. And one of the lessons that I learned in that school was my teacher or my, you know, acting coach said, he goes, look, we love to go to the movies. We love to sit in that theater and we love to watch Tom Hanks in Philadelphia and just sit there and watch this performance of this man who is dying of AIDS or Schindler's List and these horrible experiences that just leave us as, you know, you know, draped with these feelings as we're watching, we're sobbing or we're, you know, you know, statically in love or whatever it is. But then we can get up and kind of shake it off and go, wow, I just had that feeling, but good thing my life is fine, (laughs) you know, and we go to want to be transported to a place but we want to be safe. We want to have those feelings, but we want to know that it's not happening to us. And we look at those actors and actresses on the screens and we see them as heroes because they are living in make-believe situations and circumstances and making them feel real. And they're taking us on that journey with them. And the same goes if you're interviewing somebody, go with them. Don't be afraid. Don't, Don't turn your human meter off. Be there, be present with them and curious. And the best question that you can ever ask anybody is why? Whatever it is, it's like, why? Because there's always an answer to that, you know? Um, and it may cause them to stop and break, but it, it's always a great way to continue to keep digging deeper on a question. If somebody just throws something out to you, it's just, just kind of go, well, why, why did you feel that way? Or why do you think you didn't respond? Whatever the scenario is. That's a great lesson. No, this is great. Cool. I'm actually writing this down. Hope I, I don't make too much noise in the background here because I was actually yeah. writing down a lot of those key points. And it's so true. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to say this again, who you are listening. Um, this is great training for if you're in sales, if you're a leader, yeah. mom, dad, aunt, uncle, coach, friend. Yeah. 
this is this is great. I, I thank you. I I, I really want to continue this, but unfortunately, we don't have enough time here, and your time is valuable. Um, I really hope we can talk some more. I hope you can come back and and be a, a guest again, and we can share a, another story about something uh, because this yeah. was inspirational to me. You shared a lot, and I I do really really appreciate that. I appreciate our friendship, and uh, thank you. Absolutely. Break it anytime. You just reach out and, and congratulations on the podcast. Keep doing what you're doing because I think uh, there's a, it just helps make the world needs more people like you putting out good messages mm-hmm. to help us all embody, you know, real, whether it's reaching across the aisle, but we're, we're still America and we still are human beings that should and really do need to rem- be reminded to care for one another deeply. Every day is a growing process. I always, you know, yep. I, I didn't come up with this line, but, uh, you know, we, we are all students of life and every day is a learning experience. So just go out and celebrate it. So again, Mark, Mark thanks for your time today. I'm sure. so glad we had that conversation a couple of years ago uh, after taping and uh, this continued this friendship. And uh, again, I appreciate that. And, and, and you bet. congratulations to you. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen next with you. I'm always uh-huh. inspired by all, all of your talent. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You have been listening to Amplify Your Mindset with Ricky Kalman. For more information on Ricky Kalman's corporate and personal development programs, visit rickykalman.com.